school is uh, delighted to be able to uh, sponsor uh, this new uh, lecture series, the David Steinem Memorial Lecture Series. Uh, this is the inaugural uh, lecture series that will be continuing from year to year. And uh, uh, we'd like to express our appreciation to the Steinem family for supporting this lecture series and particularly to this is Linda Stein and David Stein, Seymour uh, uh, David Steinman's uh, wife, and to his daughter Warren, Warren Stein. Uh, today's lecture, uh, Anti Semitism, Law, Religious Visibility, and Hate Speech, our two guest lecturers are Professor Shana Van Craig from the Faculty of Law at McGill University and Rabbi Adam Shire. Uh, from Congregation Shah in Westmount. Uh, we're delighted to be able to have your input into this lecture series. Um, the uh, lecture series continues the, the fourth and final uh, lecture will be given uh, next, uh, next week, November 14th, uh, on immigration, minority rights, and religious freedom in the United States and Canada with Dr. Nathan Bowman, uh, co-director of the Center of Law uh, at William and Mary School of Law and Dr. Morton Weinfeld, Director of Canadian Ethnic Studies at the Department of Sociology at McGill. Uh, I'd uh, like to briefly introduce uh, Lauren Steinman. Lauren is a PhD student at the School of Religious Studies. Uh, her work, uh, her research project uh, in her PhD work largely focuses on issues of uh, religious extremism, both right and left wing forms of religious extremism. So it has a, certainly has a connection to some of the themes being explored in this uh, lecture series this year. Lauren? not. Okay, so hi everyone. Um, my name is Lauren Steinman and I would like to take this opportunity to welcome you to the lecture series in memory of my father, Seymour David Steinman. The Judeo-Christian tradition is replete with laws and teachings that instruct individuals on how to live a life of dignity and righteousness. It is within this framework that we are called to an adherence of the Ten Commandments, which stipulate series of laws that God delivered to Moses in the book of Exodus. The fifth commandment states that one should honor one's parents in the context of their lifetime. While I adhere to this precept throughout my past childhood and adult years, it is this principle which informs the present lecture series. It is through this project that I have chosen to readapt the commandment to honor the memory of the departed parent, my father, Seymour David Steinman. My late father, Seymour David Steinman, 
going through proper education and dialogue, which brings to bear the importance of memory and the historical past that societies can collectively work towards capturing these dark and divisive forces. I do hope that you will enjoy tonight's lectures, and I believe that both presentations are highly pertinent to the underlying complexities that concern religious and cultural diversity, as well as difference, and the ever-present problem of extremism and violence, which we as Quebecers and as Canadians are attempting to navigate and grasp in this ever-changing social landscape. The overarching topic of tonight's lectures is that of anti-Semitism, the law, religious visibility, and hate speech. I will actually be tonight a moderator for the lectures, and I anticipate some very interesting presentations from both of our invited guest speakers. I'll begin by introducing each guest speaker separately prior to the commencement of their respective presentations. The lectures will then be followed by a question and answer period where you will all be given a chance to engage directly with the guest speakers and the material that has been covered. So with that, I will begin by introducing Dr. Shauna Von Craig, our first guest speaker. Shauna von Craig is Professor of Law at McGill University. Dr. von Craig has taught at the McGill Faculty of Law since 1993 and served as Associate Dean of Graduate Studies in Law from the years 2007 to 2010. The graduate of the University of Toronto and Columbia University, she clerked for the Right Honorable Brian Dixon, Chief Justice of Canada from 1989 to 1990. Her areas of research and writing include religious communities and law, identity and integrity in law, religious diversity in education, children and the law of civil wrongs, comparative legal traditions and methodology, law and literature, and the stories in legal education. She has been involved in the design and implementation of innovations and programs and pedagogy at McGill, and is active in McGill's Institute of Comparative Law Center for Human Rights and Legal Pluralism, and Paul Andre Crepeau's Center for Private and Comparative Law. In 2017, she received the One World Award from Montreal's Temple Emmanuel Beth Shalom in recognition of her contributions to community and outreach. So with that, I give you Dr. Sean Conrad. Of a course 
dedicated to the ways in which law shapes and responds to human diversity in any society, but especially the one in which McGill is situated, that I address you this evening. This fall, I'm teaching social diversity and law again. One of the case studies that we explore together in the course is Bill 21. I know you're aware of the key pieces of Bill 21, and I will just spend a little bit of time in the first part of my remarks tonight on the ways in which it illustrates how visibility and invisibility matter. That is, Bill 21 serves as an ideal substantive introduction to the complexities of the visible and the invisible in the context of faith. I'm going to then turn to hate and her harmful speech and behavior, and again we'll comment on the visible and the invisible, the places we look and the places we may not notice. And finally, I will turn to law and explore the visible and not so visible norms that govern our everyday lives and human interactions. Throughout, I will incorporate examples and challenges and voices linked to Jewish identity. The experience of being the literal and symbolic other is woven into Jewish identity. It is part of the fabric of Jewish history. But it also goes hand in hand with belonging, with participating, with willingness to engage in tough conversations, with collaborations across the permeable borders that shape community, with imagining and identifying with individuals and groups who know the phenomenon of otherness all too well. So let me start with the visibility and invisibility of faith. Introduced in March of this year in Quebec's National Assembly, Bill 21, an act respecting the laicity of the state, purports to affirm the particular secular character of Quebec by articulating foundational principles and the precise requirements to which they give rise. Four principles ground the characterization of Quebec as a lay state, separation of state and religion, state religious neutrality, equality of citizens, and freedom of conscience and religion. The bill then moves to the requirements that flow from the characterization, focusing on the appearance of religious neutrality and the wearing of religious symbols. There is a long list of problems with the act respecting the legacy of the state. But I want to point out the dynamics of the visible and invisible with reference to the legislation. First, the vocabulary in the bill is explicit and visible. Laicity is created as a new English word, ostensibly to capture the unique nature of secularism or religious neutrality, laicity in Quebec. Instead of religion, singular, the bill refers to religions, plural, to make sure that all faith communities get the message. But notice the invisible in the text. Religious symbols are left undefined ostensibly to invite the broadest possible interpretation, but also leaving room for ongoing confusion and argument. Most obviously, the link is invisible between the objective of ensuring religious neutrality of contemporary state institutions and the means of prohibition on the wearing of particular items by individuals of faith. And recognition that existing institutions and frameworks, including the Quebec Charter of Human Rights and Freedoms, already served the goals of fairness, equality, state neutrality, and meaningful integration of all members of society is also submerged from view. Conversely, fear of unchecked bias on the part of the individuals targeted by the act as they interact with others is manufactured and enlarged. Something that could have faded into the background is brought into view and then held in focus. Notice that paying attention to how faith manifests itself and how individuals present themselves is not unique. In Philip Roth's short story, Eli the Fanatic, a Jewish lawyer named Eli Peck sends a letter to Mr. Surat, the headmaster of the town's yeshiva. He is particularly concerned about the appearance of one man dressed in black, complete with side curls and a black hat. Peck writes, it seems to me that what most disturbs my neighbors are the visits to town by the gentleman in the black hat, suit, etc. This is a progressive suburban community whose members, both Jewish and Gentile, are anxious that their families live in comfort and beauty and serenity. This is, after all, the 20th century, and we do not think it too much to ask 
that the members of our community dress in a manner appropriate to the time and place. Suraf responds, the suit the gentleman wears is all he's got. <clears throat> Notice that there, um, sorry, so let me talk for a moment about why the man in the black suit makes them, uh, everyone nervous in the Philip Roth story. The man makes Jewish identity visible in a way that it hadn't been for the people in that community, much like the act Respecting laicity uh, uh, in Quebec makes the hijab visible again after it had faded from view over the past 20 years. If crosses on public schools are no longer seen, indeed their religious character has become invisible, why not kippahs or kirpans, turbans and chadors? Now, of course, this way of thinking about the men in the black suit twists the approach found in the legislation. It is a desire to erase the significance of the visible rather than a literal preference for the invisible. Now notice that there may actually be room for a considerable degree of agreement over the inappropriateness of entangling religiosity with the tasks of judging or teaching or policing. As Victor Goldblum pointed out at the time of the Bouchard-Taylor hearings, the Quebec Jewish community largely shares Quebec values and experiences. One of those shared values is the expectation that public institutions, rules, and actors commit to transparent equality in the treatment of all individuals. We should indeed be wary of entanglement or excessive influence. One good example <coughs> found particularly in the U.S. is that of evangelical influence over access to reproductive health services and counseling. Here is the kind of dangerous intertwining of religious norms with government policy that we should be worried about, the invisible exertion of power over women's health decisions. This is the kind of religion state overlap that should be made more visible, that should be subjected to intense scrutiny, and that can be contrasted with the simplistic assumption that visible religious symbols worn by individuals create that kind of problematic overlap, something for which there is absolutely no solid basis in fact. The search for a working definition of a secular yet socially diverse society need not be confused with an attempt to erase or make invisible the markers of faith that individuals may wear. Indeed, the liberal commitment to individual freedom and choice may require that the man in the black suit, the only suit he's got, present himself as he wishes, even if that makes others, including those who share his faith, but not the visible manifestation, uncomfortable. Let me now turn briefly to the visibility and invisibility of hate. The Bouchard-Taylor report suggested it is in Quebec society's interest to get to know the Jewish community better, a recommendation following on the heels of striking distortions and anti-Semitic accusations aired by participants in the hearings. Pierre Antille and Ira Robinson, historians of Quebec's Jewish communities, remind us that Jews have lived in Quebec since the 18th century with significant communal presence for over 100 years. Their place as others and as a visible minority has fluctuated but never disappeared, but they are no longer the sole significant non-Christian, non-Aboriginal group in Quebec. They have been joined by, among others, Muslims, Hindus, and Sikhs. Fear of the other, of the potential attacker, whether on the part of a member of a majority group or of a minority group, can be too easily grounded in the visible. Anti-migration rhetoric, and in particular anti-Muslim migration rhetoric, seems to suggest that visible others will arrive and damage us. But a recent study showed that the only rise in dangerous activity in the production of hate associated with the arrival of visible asylum seekers or immigrants is located among radical white supremacy groups. We see a resurgence of visible white nationalism, for example, in the neo-Nazi marches in Virginia as the populations of North American and Western European liberal democratic states become more visibly diverse. It is not easy to articulate, to make visible, what we are and should be scared of. And all of us can play a role in questioning the ways in which fear and hate can be manufactured and sustained. A survey carried out for the Quebec Human Rights Commission three years ago to mark the 
40th anniversary of the Quebec Charter of Human Rights and Freedoms captured contemporary perceptions and attitudes of Quebecers to the human rights framework in place. It showed that education, enriched knowledge, and experience, literal proximity, were particularly significant factors in determining openness to diversity and support for human rights. <coughs> Just shows that surveys usually show us exactly what we already knew. Among its findings, the survey flagged as problematic a level of respect for or willingness to accommodate religious difference. People without experience of religious neighbors or classmates or teachers tend to be suspicious. People without high levels of education tend to be susceptible to the transformation of ignorance into hate. The point is that making these facts more visible, as in the report based on the survey, brings them to the attention of the commission, its members, and its future projects. At the same time, we should perhaps be more fearful of the hate we do not see. The world of cyberspace and the challenge of anonymity and invisibility presents us with challenges that can feel overwhelming. Cyber hate may not evoke the same visceral reaction as a physical attack on a place of worship, but it is ubiquitous, a threat to public security and insidious in its recruitment of participants in the creation of language and actions that promote hatred. As Professor Jocelyn McCure points out in a recent article on the regulation of hateful and harmful speech, new information and communication technologies give anyone who has an internet connection multiple platforms to express themselves without first having to go through gatekeepers. Trolls are now better known as characters of the internet, he says, than as inhabitants of Scandinavian caves and forests, and I would add, or the pages of Harry Potter. We started with a piece of legislation, an explicit, visible example of law that has shaped conversations, actions, and alliances. We then briefly talked about the visible and invisible sites and forms of fear and hate. In response to those sites and forms, people usually turn to law, this time as a vehicle of response and remedy, of condemnation, of safety. So in the time remaining, I'm going to talk about the visible and not so visible faces and functions of law. Over three decades ago, I was introduced, along with many first-year students of law in Canada, to two Ontario cases from the 1940s. <clears throat> they were both focused on racist and anti-Semitic restrictions on the transfer of land. This was in cottage country in northern Ontario. In one of the cases, decided in 1945, the Ontario High Court held that forbidding the sale of land to, quote, Jews and other objectionable would-be purchasers was contrary to public policy. In the second, in 1948, the same court declared that individual freedom to contract could not be constrained. That means that the restrictions stayed. My professor led us to a discussion of some of the most tenacious and difficult problems in the study and practice of law, and provocatively pointed out the dangers of referring to public policy, given that 1940s Ontario was far from dedicated to the eradication of anti-Semitism. <coughs> Interestingly, the Supreme Court of Canada was noticeable in its absence from the discussion. The second case did, in fact, make it to the highest court, but members of that court offered no reasons that sounded like they wanted to do the right thing in terms of morality and justice in post-World War II Canada. Instead, their reasons for lifting the restrictions on the sale of the land to Jews were grounded in the scope of an arcane rule in property conveyancing and alternatively in the uncertainty of the words used in the agreement. One of the judges said that the problem was that the language of the clause under scrutiny failed, quote, to indicate the intention of the parties as to the amount or degree of the prohibited race or blood that might be permitted. That was the problem with it. For a first year student in law, this was somewhat bewildering. Why not count on courts to explicitly, visibly do the right thing? Use law as a tool to correct discriminatory attitudes and harmful behaviors. What good was an invisible and backdoor opening to the possibility of changing the customs and interactions of people in their everyday lives? Three years later, 30 years ago, I found myself at the Supreme Court of Canada, 
clerking for Chief Justice Brian Dixon when the case of Keekstra arrived on appeal. By then, I was beginning to appreciate the complexities of drawing straightforward, visible, causal connections between the words of the Supreme Court judgment and the ways in which members of Canadian society interact with each other. Keekstra invited the Supreme Court to address head-on for the first time under the fairly new Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms <coughs> the question of whether criminal law should be used to suppress the willful promotion of hatred. At issue was the scope of free expression in this country and its relationship to respect for equality and multicultural diversity, also visibly protected by the Charter. So let's go back in time together. James Keekstra taught social studies courses to grade 12 students in Eckville, Alberta. In them, he taught that Jews and Judaism were linked to, to certain attributes or adjectives, including treacherous, subversive, sadistic, evil, and had created the myth of the Holocaust to gain sympathy. He was charged under the Criminal Code of Canada with willful promotion of hatred against an identifiable group. The court had to decide whether the promotion of hatred in the form of hate literature or hate propaganda or hate mongering was protected expression or not under the Charter. I have gone back to the memo I wrote for Chief Justice Dixon, preparing him to hear the case. I wrote, we are dealing with something that is intangible and emotional. And while we know it is linked to greater intolerance and racism in society, there is no clear-cut way to say that the legislation is not controlling an attempt to convey a meaning. The words and acts are those which, in their very essence, are incompatible with the conditions necessary to support the exercise of rights and freedoms in a free and democratic society like Canada. The drafting of a careful response to the hard questions raised here will test this court's responsiveness to new ideas about expression. The final majority judgment by Chief Justice Dixon offered that kind of careful response. He was willing to include Keekstra's words within a large and generous definition of human expression, but was also insistent on recognizing the harmful nature of those words for individuals, groups, and importantly, our entire society, as he upheld the criminal code provision. The boundaries between acceptable and protected expression on one hand and criminally prohibited expression on the other were drawn precisely where the criminal code had suggested, at willful promotion of hatred against an identifiable group. Criminalizing this kind of expression indicates Canada's desire to use its strongest and most visible legal tool available for condemnation. And in 2013, the Supreme Court reaffirmed its support for the criminal regulation of hate speech, saying that hate speech lays the groundwork for possible, later, broad attacks on vulnerable groups. Representations, the court said, that expose a target group to detestation tend to inspire enmity and extreme ill will against them, which goes beyond mere disdain or dislike. Representations vilifying a person or group will seek to abuse, denigrate, or de delegitimize them, to render them lawless, dangerous, unworthy, or unacceptable in the eyes of the audience. Hate speech goes far beyond merely discrediting, humiliating, or offending the victims. But if we ask ourselves whether putting Keekstra in jail can be visibly connected to a sense of collective responsibility to infuse our speech with respect for others, I think we should be skeptical. Perhaps that skepticism is particularly appropriate when we imagine using the criminal law in a meaningful and far-reaching way to delineate boundaries in the context of electronic communication. Back in 1989, a companion case argued at the Supreme Court along with Keekstra was Taylor, in which John Ross Taylor, president of the Western Guard Party, had placed hateful anti-Semitic messages on a telephone answering machine and then publicized the Toronto phone number, inviting callers to dial in and listen. Now this seems laughably antiquated now. We have come a long way from the time at which we worried about telephone answering messages. Now, as I have already suggested, we are focused on cyber-related expression. And under the criminal code, offenses such as uttering threats, defamatory libel, criminal harassment, distribution and production of child pornography, and of course, willful promotion of hatred can all belong on a list of cyber-related activities. 
More difficult, however, to target is cyberbullying, something that we know can have tragic consequences. Legislative attempts to target electronic communication expected to cause fear, distress, or damage to well-being have been struck down for infringing free expression by casting the net much too broadly. The judgments I've talked about show that the Charter can provide meaningful <coughs> limits to individual freedom, but that those limits are themselves necessarily limited in their form and scope. Harmful words are not the same as hate speech, and they can't be treated that way. Trying to characterize all harmful speech as hate speech, and thus to criminalize it, may seem like the best way to deal with it. But in addition to the limits on doing so, most visibly found in the very concrete requirements, willful promotion of hatred, identifiable group, there are risks. The lesson I first learned from my first year property law professor <clears throat> and continue to think about is that there exist other, perhaps less visible, but perhaps more effective ways to govern difficult terrain. One of those less visible forms of law is private law, the obligations that each of us owe to those around us. For example, to take care in our actions or to uphold agreements. A good recent example from the US decided in July of this year is a case in which a judge recommended that the creator of a neo-Nazi website pay $14 million in damages. Tanya Gersh, a Jewish real estate agent in Montana, was subjected to a vicious and sustained anti-Semitic uh, harassment and intimidation campaign that included 700 messages sent when the publisher of the Daily Stormer website called for a troll storm against her and her family. That same publisher had earlier been ordered in separate lawsuits to pay millions in damages <coughs> to a Muslim comedian and to an African American woman student government leader. The possibility of bringing a claim against another individual and asking for compensation for actual harm suffered represents an alternative response that may coexist with or replace criminal sanctions. In the law of civil wrongs in Canada, and by the way, we don't actually award millions of dollars in punitive <laughs> damages here, um, but in the law of civil wrongs, there are two principal sources for examining the nature of the duty not to harm another person. In the Civil Code of Quebec, in Article 1450, Seven, there is a short provision that renowned McGill jurists and scholars, F.R. Scott, Paul Andre Tricot, and Erwin Kotler, have referred to as a mini bill of rights. And here we find the obligation to act reasonably so as not to cause injury to another person. A failure in the duty results in liability to repair the harm caused. You have to say, sorry, and you do so with money. In Anglo-Canadian common law, we find the source for this obligation in the 1932 judgment of the English House of Lords, which famously picked up on the biblical directive to love your neighbor as yourself. In the judgment, Lord Atkins says, the rule that you are to love your neighbor becomes in law, you must not injure your neighbor. You must take reasonable care to avoid acts or omissions which you can reasonably foresee would be likely to injure your neighbor. This is referred to as the neighbor principle and it quietly, compared to, civil, uh, to criminal law, and in a way invisibly shapes our actions and our expectations. The late Alan Linden, a Jewish Canadian jurist of justice, talks about the spirit of the neighbor principle and of Article 1457 of the Civil Code of Quebec as follows. It plays a role in the law, not unlike the role that the Bible plays for Christians, or the Torah plays for Jews, or the Quran for Muslims. It inspires those noble thoughts and deeds of which we need more in the modern world, not less. It challenges us to dream of a beautiful world where people care about one another, feel responsible for one another, and even, dare I say it, love one another. The late Robert Cover, an American Jewish legal scholar at Yale, underscored the importance of the Jewish notion of mitzvah as obligation for the way in which secular law can round out ideas of rights and duties. The way to treat our neighbors living next to us or metaphysically connected to us comes from a deep sense of obligation, of doing the right thing, of communicating for understanding, 
of accepting the burden of listening to the person who receives our message, messages and feels injured in some way. In our actions and words, we are all sometimes going to hurt others, and we are sometimes going to be hurt by the actions and words of others. But the solutions rarely lie in legislation, criminal prosecution, or even claims for compensation. Instead, they probably lie in the neighbor principle and the constant imagination and empathy that is necessary for giving it content and meaning. This is messy, human, and aspirational, rather than clear, dictated, and prescriptive. But law is often invisible in exactly this way. Let me move to a conclusion by returning to the literal neighborhood where I started, physically close to the transformed synagogue building on Fairmount. For over two decades now, as a scholar of law and religious diversity at McGill, I have focused on the neighborhood of Utamont, and in particular on Jewish, um, Hasidic Jewish life and law. This is an ideal site for thinking about the visible and the invisible, of faith, of harm, and of law, and of human encounters between Hasidic Jewish residents and their non-Hasidic neighbors. This is where the man in the black suit is not simply a fictional character in a Philip Roth story. Instead, men, women, and children who belong to the multiple Hasidic Jewish communities at Utrecht present themselves every day in a visible, explicit way. Orthodox or traditional versions of any faith community remind us that religion, as system of belief and practice, and indeed as legal tradition, can challenge the state's rule of law in unique and powerful ways through its allegiance-demanding sources and stories, commandments, and codes. The rules that govern the interactions of the residents of Utrecht include human rights charters, the criminal code, Article 1457 of the Civil Code of Quebec, and now also an act for uh, respecting laicity. But they also include religious commandments, stories, beliefs, norms, customs, and expectations. And they go further to include normative orders found in the playgrounds, on the sidewalks, in the neighborhood newspaper. Law is both visible and invisible all of the time. Law is both formal and informal all of the time. Law is both situated at the level of the state, whether municipal, provincial, or federal, and at the level of civil society all of the time. Turning only to the official, the formal, the visible rules to figure out how religious communities and their members live in a society provides a very partial view. Instead, we can look for less visible ways <coughs> in which the sacred and the secular always share space as neighbors in overlapping spheres. So, for example, we can contemplate the sharing of a school playground in Utrecht by Hasidic and non-Hasidic children after school hours and on the weekends. We can consider the recent recommendations of the Director of Youth Protection in Quebec uh, to do a better job of adapting child welfare practices with respect to the children of insular communities. We can examine the possibilities of meeting provincial education requirements through homeschooling. For over a hundred years, Jews and non-Jews in Utrecht have struggled to find measures that might bring reasonable peace and harmony. From the early 1900s, when public school dances were moved after intense discussions from Friday to Saturday nights, to the early 2000s and the negotiation of dates for sukkah building every fall. As illustrated in Pierre Hartil and Ira Robinson's very recently published book collection, Les Juifs Hasidiques de Montréal, conversations continue, conflicts continue, and the construction and sustainability of coexistence is always dynamic, <coughs> sometimes surprising. Leonard Cohen wrote, there is a crack in everything, that's how the light gets in. It is right to worry about harmful language and action about ungrounded antagonism to religious minority participants in society, about hate directed at particular communities, whether newly arrived or long integrated. But the most visible narratives are sometimes not the most important, and sometimes they lead us to dead ends. Instead, looking for what might seem invisible, like the synagogue behind the school, is worthwhile, whether in thinking about faith, about hate, or about law. It is right to worry about barriers to holding on to faith while participating fully in civil society. It is right to worry about the boundaries between
between harmful and even distressing words and actions on one hand and insidious hate mongering on the other. But it is also crucial to realize that barriers can come down and boundaries can shift. What is visible today may become invisible and vice versa. There are cracks in everything. I started with an image of a synagogue from a past generation transformed into a school and have used it as a metaphor to examine visibility and invisibility matters and how visibility and invisibility matter. But communities, uh, communities evolve. <clears throat> Neighborhoods change, buildings take on new shapes and functions. I will end by walking us all a few blocks away in order to arrive at a Hasidic Jewish bakery on Bernard and Park. If you haven't been there, I highly recommend it. <laughs> Friday's the best day to go. This is Hesky's, open to all, a meeting place of religious and secular clients speaking to each other and their children in a mix of languages, often greeted by Hesky himself as they wait for their challah or rugula or babka or cheesecake. Perhaps this is a metaphor for the next generation. That's how the life gets in. I received an email from him. He forwarded a sermon 
of Rabbi Jonathan Saxon uh, from, from the UK. And the sermon actually mentions uh, his brother, uh, late brother Ralph, but, but the sermon was really about legacy. And the sermon asked the question, how do you want to be remembered? And the answer to the question in that sermon was, uh, was too often we spend our time on things that are urgent and neglect the things that are important, the good we do, the love we give, the difference we make to other people's lives. And so I, I find that very fitting as he shared with me this question, how do you want to be remembered that we sit here this evening and offer thoughts in, in his memory. So thank you for, for thank you Lauren for all of your hard work to organize this and all the sessions and, and Linda as well. Uh, we pray that uh, Seymour's uh, Nishama, his soul should have an only and should ascend to the, to the highest heights of, of the heavens. Um, it's also an honor to be here with Dr. Matt Bagg and to, uh, to share this evening with her. She's uh, presented at, at, at the Shar uh, uh, not, not long ago, a few, I guess a few months ago. And uh, the beautiful imagery of, of the Jewish tapestry of Montreal reflecting deeper truths. And suddenly I'm very hungry for Russian babka from Chesky's. That's, uh, I'm sure they're open late tonight. It's Thursday night. Um, I, I want to, to start the, the, the topic of, of this uh, talk, I hope brief talk, is the anatomy of anti Semitism, which I gave the topic before I started writing the talk, of course, and realized that that's a big, that's a big topic, the anatomy of anti-Semitism. What is, what is anti-Semitism? And I want to start with, with two jokes, because, you know, I think at, at a certain point, when something's been around for, for a millennia, and there's this hatred that just exists and won't go away, you can try lots of different ways of coping with it. And, and you speak up, and you run away, and you hide, and, and then at a certain point, the gallows humor comes out, and there are pre-war jokes that, that were actually they're, they're existed in, in Germany, in pre-war Germany. One has two elderly Jews sitting in a Berlin park, with one of them reading a, a Yiddish newspaper, and the other scanning the pages of Der Sturmer, and the, the, the classic anti-Semitic uh, rag, and the latter Jew is, is laughing. One reading Der Sturmer is, is actually laughing. And this proves too much for the former Jew who says, it's not enough that you read that Nazi paper, but you find it funny too? Look, replies the other, if I read your paper, if I read the Yiddish paper, what do I see? Jews deported, Jews assaulted, Jews insulted, Jewish property confiscated. But I read Der Sturmer and there's finally good news. It seems that we Jews own and control the world. <laughs> Uh, another joke says that sees an anti-Semite talking and saying that the problems of the world are all because of the Jews. And the Jew overhears this statement. The problems of the world are all because of the Jews. And the Jew interjects and says, not only the Jews, the bicyclists also. The cyclists are the problem, the cyclists and the Jews. And the anti-Semite looks at him quizzically and says, why the cyclists? And he answered, well, why the Jews? That's the joke. That's the... And the coping mechanism, of course, is, is very important for us because ultimately, you know, humor, humor thrives when there's tension. And humor thrives when, when there's no simple path out. And the, the tragedy of anti-Semitism is that you know, identifying it is half the battle. We know what it is when we, when we see it and experience it, but even the very term, anti-Semitism, is something that we've struggled with over the years because what does it mean? What is the Semitism that everyone is, is protesting, that everyone is against? I don't know what Semitism is. Do I believe in Semitism, that she, people should oppose my, my beliefs? And the scholar Deborah Lipstadt, the historian Deborah Lipstadt has has proposed that we take the hyphen out of anti-Semitism, just make it one term because it's not anti-Semitism. Or others have said it should be replaced entirely. What is it? It's anti-Jewish. Call it a call it for what it is. Let's stop calling it anti-Semitic. What a sanitized term. Nobody knows any Semites that should be protected. Anti-Jewish. That's what that's what the phrase is. And I'll speak, you know, personally for a moment. A uh, a Hasidic Jew with whom I'm, I'm a, a close friend. We speak, he speaks Yiddish as his primary language and, and uh, of course, an Anglophone. 
and we meet somewhere in the middle. I speak, uh, my German is better than my Yiddish, so I try, he tries a little bit with his, his English, but he works and operates primarily in Yiddish, lives here in, in Montreal, and is a very successful businessman, a family man, and he asked me uh, over, over dinner one night, we shared a Shabbat dinner together, and he said to me, he said to me, Rabbi, tell me, how much are you Jewish? There was a language gap there. He said, how much am I Jewish? I'm, I'm pretty Jewish, I think. I'm, I would say close to 100%, if you, <laughs> I think. I'm Jewish. And, and he, was, he was kind of struggling, and there were other people around, and started, started speaking in Yiddish, and the pace got faster and faster, kind of frustrated, trying to ask this question. And what was the question? The question was, how much of the time are you identified as a Jew when you walk out there in the streets? Meaning you are a rabbi, but clean-shaven, can put on a baseball hat, walk into the Bell Center, cheer for my Buffalo Sabres or the Habs or whatever it is, and leave, and nobody will judge you as a Jew. I, on the other hand, he said to me, I have these long pipes, I have the beard, I can't walk onto a bus in Montreal without being judged for something that I haven't done, that I shouldn't be responsible for without people making assumptions about me. I am a tax-paying Canadian <coughs> citizen and contribute to society in whatever way that I, I, I think is, is a productive way of contributing to society, and yet I can't walk into the, into the, into, into the depot, no, I can't walk into the, the bodega down the street, I can't, I can't walk anywhere without being judged for being a Jew. And I reflected on my own experience as a Jew and with anti-Semitism, and I'll, I'll say very clearly, I don't see myself as a victim of anti-Semitism, but I see myself as a community that has been historically and continues to be victimized. I grew up in the United States, in Rochester, New York. My experiences with anti-Semitism were, I think, fairly typical for a public school student in Rochester, New York. I was struggling for years with the decision to wear a kippah. I did not come from a religious background. And as a public school student of what might be called an upper middle class public school that was about 25% Jewish, there were very, I think maybe one other kid in the school who wore, wore a kippah. And I was becoming more and more connected to my faith, to my religion. And I wanted to wear a kippah, but I had to strategically think about what the right day was, what the right time was, who would notice it the least, whatever things people go, you know, thoughts go through, go through people's minds. There's, you know, when we're, when we're in our teens and, and even in our early 20s, we're consumed with what people think, with what people think about, about us. And I think later on in life, people realize, maybe around middle age, maybe around 50s, people realize that I don't care what people think about me. And then I've been told that even later in life, one notices that no one was watching the whole time, no one was paying attention the whole time. But back then, we're in our teens and consumed with image and consumed with what people will think about, about me. And finally, I, I decided that it was the year was coming to an end and I said, I have to do this at a certain point. I, if I don't do that, you know, how weak am I? I know I'm gonna wear a kippah, I know that's gonna be part of my identity. What's the day? And so I chose the first day of finals. Uh, uh, final exams uh, to wear my kippah. And I think a lot of people who noticed it thought I was wearing it for good luck. And that wasn't it. I chose it because that was the day that everyone's consumed in their own world and so busy and their noses are in there. I thought that, that, that the fewest people would, uh, would, would actually notice that I was wearing a kippah. And on the first day I wore a kippah, I had to go from my locker on the third floor of the school to the exam room on the second floor. And they had these stairways, I don't know what they're called, the architectural term, switch back stairway where you walk halfway down the flight and then turn back and walk. And there's a little wall there, I'm landing on the floor, on the floor above. And as I was walking down, I stopped in my tracks as I made the turn and I noticed that another student had put a piece of paper, taped a piece of paper right there with a swastika on the paper right there so that I would see it right as I went down. I don't know who did it. They ran in front of me to do it. I don't remember who did it. But that's something that, that stayed with me. I didn't feel for one moment that my, my life was being, was being threatened. There was a um, calling in school. There was a, uh, a Jewish student who got into a fight with another student. I don't know who got into the fight with whom. But they planned a brawl in the school to meet in one of the parks in, in the school. And it was going to be the Jewish students against the non-Jewish students, 25% versus 75% 
of the school, not a fair fight, but it never is. And, uh, and I recall going to that, this is in, in grade nine, I recall driving to that to protect my friend and someone had tipped off the police and the police were at the entrance of the park checking people going in. But it was one of those, those moments that you realize that there's a difference in society, that people are focusing on noticing the differences and judging us against the differences. So what is anti-anti-Semitism? It's a lot of different things and I want to go through just a few of the, of the manifestations that as a member of the community, as a leader of, of, of our Jewish community, that one sees. And one can't sit here even at McGill and not talk about historical anti-Semitism, not talk about the history of anti-Semitism, which has existed for as long as the Jewish people have, have existed. And even sitting here, not, not going, back, going back less than a century, we, we, uh, in 1928, the, the Dean of Arts and Sciences at, at McGill, Dean Mackay, wrote a long memo to the principal, Sir Arthur Curry, on the desirability of establishing a quota for Jewish students. Sir Arthur Curry, of course, the principal was the head of the Canadian forces in, in, in Europe in World War I, who was accused of embezzling $11,000 of regimented funds for personal use and then became principal of McGill. But in any event, let's establish a quota for Jewish students in, uh, at, at McGill. And, uh, and the justification was on the grounds that the Jews are not here to stay. It was that the Jews are ultimately just going to be educated here and then leave Canada for, for greener pastures. And as he put it, that in the economic conditions of the day, 1928, McGill, Dean of Arts and Sciences, writing to the principal, wrote that the Jew is the least desirable immigrant because he becomes a money lender, a merchant, a doctor, or a lawyer, and then says the Dean, we don't need any more of this class in Canada. Jews, he continued, were a danger for the university Whereas the experience of American universities showed when a Jew moves in, then Christians move out. Now, why do Christians move out when the Jews move in? Not because of anti-Semitism, Dean Mackay wrote, purely for personal reasons, personal decisions, not for reasons of anti-Semitism. And a, a few years later, in, in October 1933, when, when things are heating up overseas, a student wrote to, to Principal Curry and asked him to support a new organization on campus, which would, one of the goals of the organization would be to assist students who were expelled from German universities by the Nazis, would assist bringing them here to, here to Canada. And the students invited the principal to meet the head of this new organization, a man named Jane Parks, who is an Anglican clergyman, a scholar of classical Judaism, was heading this organization, and he was an outspoken opponent of anti-Semitism. And Curry refused to meet Parks uh, because of, um, or, or even to lend his name to the project. He said, he agrees that there are many students who have, been, who, have, who have suffered persecution, and I would throw, he wrote, I would throw no cold water on efforts to help those who were thrown out by the Nazis, but were I able to contribute more than I do now, then I would give support to that project. Because I have limited energies, he wrote, I want to help students driven out of McGill because they lack the financial resources to see them through to, uh, to graduation. So there's limited, limited uh, resources. We, 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 uh, there's also, and then my, my, uh, I'll give credit to my, my father-in-law, Rabbi Michael Brown, who's done, Professor Michael Brown from York University, who did a good deal of uh, research on anti-Semitism in Canada, uh, in particular in the 1930s and 40s, and he, he uncovered that uh, the president of the University of Toronto, a man named H.J. H. J. Cody, who was an Anglican clergyman, wrote to McGill asking about the university's policy regarding Jewish students who requested not to write their exams on Shabbat or on holidays. And Principal Curry replied immediately, he said, we have never made any exceptions except for in two cases, both of them rabbis' daughters. And he explained, it's our experience that the Hebrew clergy are loudest in their protest. And I don't think that the students care a rap whether they write the examination on Saturday or not, the vehemence of the protest too lessens each year, lessens each year. Um, and you know, we can go on and on with these, with these examples. So I think historical anti-Semitism is, is certainly important to, uh, to point out and discuss, but I will say that historical anti-Semitism has, has changed, it has evolved. The motivations that led the Jewish community of Montreal, for example, to establish many of our communal institutions, to establish our own golf clubs, because where else is a Jew going to golf? To establish our own hospitals, because where else is a Jewish doctor going to practice? To establish our own, our own fitness centers, the YMHA, why, where else 
are Jews going to go schwitz and work out and, and engage in physical activity? They can't go to the other places. Where else are Jews going to go study if there's a quota at this, at this school? And many of those impediments that, that, uh, that were typical of, of classical anti-Semitism do not exist anymore, do not exist in, in Western society. There is no country in the Western world, in the civilized world, that has codified laws that persecute the Jewish community as was historically, as was historically the case. And I want to step back and appreciate the blessing that is to live in Canada in the 21st century and in exploring anti-Semitism, don't want to, won't, don't want to uh, dismiss this reality as, as a blessing, that this perhaps is the greatest time in the greatest country here in Canada for a Jew to exist at any point in human history. That doesn't mean it's perfect. And it doesn't even mean it's good. It just means it's better than it's ever, than it's ever been and the impediments that have existed in terms of political, uh, being active in politics or in any professional area of, of professional existence and that I have lived in Montreal now for 15 years. I have worn a kippah on the streets of Montreal for 15 years and never have I heard a word of protest or question uh, from anyone at any point that made me feel uncomfortable or self-conscious about, about my keeper, which I can't say about living in Germany and I can't say about my experiences in France and, and elsewhere in Europe and in, and in Venezuela and many other countries where I'm not comfortable wearing a kippah, where I've been advised not to wear a kippah, and where I've been shouted out for wearing a kippah, uh, both by people who wanted to protect me and by those who were, who were offended by, by my very by my very existence. Where do we see anti-Semitism? Where does the Jewish community perceive anti-Semitism? It perceives it for sure in the political realm. And I could give example after example after example of where anti-Semitism emerges in politics. One could point no further than the United Nations Human Rights Council. And much has been said about this council, much has been said about uh, the corruption that exists within, within the council, the motivations of the council, but simply from its, uh, from its inception, I'm not sure of the year, but through 2016, the United Nations Human Rights Council adopted a total of 128 resolutions. That's the council that oversees human rights in the world. 128 resolutions. Of these resolutions, 67 related to Israel. 61 related to the rest of the world. So more than half, to simplify the math, more than half, 62% of the countries, by the way, that are represented at the, Un at the United Nations Human Rights Council don't pass the basic uh, requirements for free speech within their countries, but we'll put that aside as to, as to who is judging whom. But more than half of the resolutions targeting, targeting Israel. And I want to kind of question that for a moment. W what is happening there? And, and for me, there are two possible options. Number one is that Israel is the worst violator of human rights. I hope nobody's uh, recording this and taking that quote out of, out of context. But one option for this is that Israel is the worst violator of, of human rights. Um, it's a difficult premise for me personally to accept. Um, as one who, who knows Israel intimately, has family living there, um, is deeply connected with what goes on in the country, and, and both in terms of the problems of the country and and what I find very inspiring and beautiful uh, a country. And also, as one looks around the world and, and, and looks at you know, torture in, in Algeria, one looks at forced child labor in the Congo, one looks at attacks on dissidents in, in Cuba, one looks at abuse of foreign workers in Qatar, one looks at, 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 at detentions in the United Arab Emirates, one looks at the, at, at the imprisonment of democracy leaders in Venezuela, one looks at arbitrary arrests in Vietnam, one looks at the way that that women, that gays, are treated in, in much, of, much of the Middle East. It's very difficult for me to accept that Israel is the absolute worst violator of human rights to the point where Israel would be singled out, um, would be singled out by more than half of, of the resolutions and there were certain years. It is getting better, there is improvement, but there were certain years in which Israel was the only country discussed at the United Nations, United Nations Human Rights Council, which has no parallel. It's not like there are a number of human rights councils in the United Nations, and this one is specifically, is specifically uh, designated as the Israel uh, Council, but this is the Council for the World, for the United Nations Human Rights Council in Geneva, 
dealing, uh, fixated primarily with Israel. So it could be, option number one is that they've hit on something that I've missed and that so many people have missed, which is that Israel is just as terrible as, as that, which I'm not willing to accept. And the other option is that there is this fixation and that it has existed for as long as Israel has existed, it has existed for as long as the Jewish people have existed, and that the illogic of this fixation states that the root of the world's problems is Israel. And that as long as we can fix what's happening in Israel, then everything else will fall into place. If you fix Israel, you fix the world. You fix the Middle East. If there's peace between Israel and the Palestinians, then, then everything else will fall into place. Then Iran and Iraq will become partners and they'll, they'll go dancing in the streets together in a, in a, in a beautiful embrace. And, 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 and the wolf and the lamb will, will lie together once again to quote the prophet, the world will be, will be at peace. And the, the, the conflation of anti-Israel and anti-Semitism, the fixation on Israel, I can think of no better explanation or worse explanation than that it is the only Jewish state in existence. A few years ago, maybe last year, two years ago, there was the case of the Jewish student who was running for office at the SSMU, at the student, uh, for, for student government here at, at McGill, and he made the claim, and won't, won't rehash history, but made the claim that his candidacy was rejected. He was voted out of, and they made a unique, um, a unique step by voting not on the whole slate, but by voting for individuals. But he made the claim that because I am Jewish and because I'm affiliated with Jewish organizations, that's why I was left out of student government. That's why I was voted out of student government. And if you remember, McGill commissioned the, in a, uh, an investigation into the matter. Um, it was Professor Spencer Boudreau who conducted uh, the investigation. The conclusion really speaks to how Jews feel when the world fixates on Israel. The conclusion said that, uh, the conclusion said, uh, quote, I can honestly say that my conclusion about this allegation that, that, that the student made, made after what I believe was a thorough investigation of the facts is that indisputable evidence does not substantiate the notion that the vote was motivated by anti-Semitism. The reason that he was not accepted or not voted in is not because he was Jewish. Rather, the reason that the report continues, I can state, however, that his affiliation with Jewish organizations that are supportive of the State of Israel, in addition to his actions against the boycott, divestment, sanction movement that targets Israel, was the reason for his non-approval. Meaning it's not because he's Jewish, it's because he likes the Jewish state. The reason that he wasn't, that he wasn't accepted. It's, it's that he's sympathetic. I mean, meaning it, it's, we've come a far away from you know, simply voicing a protest against the foreign country's policies, which is, which is always legitimate. We are determining that those who are supportive of Israel are unworthy of representing bodies here. We're not asking questions about whether he votes red or blue. We're not asking questions about, about whether he is, you know, pro-abortion or anything. We're not, we're not asking any questions about anything in his life except for what is his stance vis-a-vis -vis the state of Israel. The fixation on Israel is an expression, is a blatant expression of anti-Semitism. The fixation on Israel to the exclusion of all other causes. The European Monitoring Center issued a working definition of anti-Semitism that offered several examples of anti-Israel rhetoric that goes beyond simple criticism of a country's policies, which is always okay to criticize a country's policies. However, declaring Israel a racist state, holding it to higher standards that are applied to all other nations, can only be explained by the fact that it is the Jewish, the Jewish state. The, uh, what's my time? Okay, thank you. The, uh, one sees this simply by, by looking at publicly available documents such as the Charter of the Terrorist Organization of Hamas, which the Charter, which was written not in ancient history, but in 1988, uh, Article 7, I could read on and on, but Article 7 of this says very explicitly, we're not hiding who we are. Hamas is one of the links in the chain of jihad in the confrontation with the Zionist invasion. 
It links up with the setting out of the martyr Izzal al of Qassam and his brothers, the Muslim Brotherhood who fought the Holy War in 1936, and so on. It further relates to other historical struggles. And the, uh, it says that even if the links have become distant from each other, even if the obstacles erected by those who revolve in the Zionist or orbit, aiming at obstructing the road before the jihad fighters have rendered the pursuance of jihad impossible, nevertheless, the Hamas has been looking forward to implementing Allah's, prom Allah's promise, whatever time it might take, and they quote, the time will not come until Muslims will fight the Jews and kill them, until the Jews hide behind rocks and trees, and the rocks and trees will cry, O oh Muslim, there is a Jew hiding behind me, come on and kill him. This will not apply, and, and, and so on and so forth. I don't need to, to read more, and, and I, I don't mean to call out terror organizations for their clear ambitions to reign terror and to murder and to destroy, but we call out those who stand by idly. We call out we call out the Labour Party in, in the UK, whose leader, Jeremy Corbyn, has, has, has said many things, has called the Hamas and Hezbollah's friends, has said that it was a big mistake to label them as a terror organization, and many different examples, which leads not to isolate these as, as isolated evils, but to talk about the impact of a, an organization declaring intention for genocide and acting on that intention. And then the civilized world offering, whether it's benign support or enthusiastic support, whatever it is, where does that leave someone who feels themselves as a target for these calls for, for murder? Where does that leave the, if, if the labor wins the election in, 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 in Britain, where, where does that leave the Jewish community? That's what many are, many are asking. Just last week, in the town of, of Freiburg in Germany, there was a man named Samuel Kantorovich who wears a kippah. I don't know Samuel, but I have friends who know, who know Samuel. And he, uh, he was at the gym last week in the evening around 9.30 p.m. And as he wrote and he shared uh, on social media, he said, a guy sneaked up on me from behind, grabbed my head and tore down my kippah, shouting, you dirty Jew, and free Palestine. He spat on my kippah and threw it in the garbage. I was shocked. He looked at me and asked me, do you want me to beat you up? Bleep off, <coughs> you dirty Jew. And then he described how everyone basically stood by as this was happening in the locker room of a fitness center in Freiburg, Germany. Last year, around this time, almost exactly a year ago, I was in uh, Germany for some commemorations of Kristallnacht, which was, it was the 70th anniversary of Kristallnacht, the night of broken glass, the night in which so many synagogues were destroyed in one night and organized uh, violence against the Jewish community in, in Germany. Some of the great architectural masterpieces, and I cannot sit in a house of worship of any denomination without myself thinking of the destroyed houses of worship in Germany the more magnificent it is, the more it reminds us of the great constructions that were made in the late 19th, early 20th century that were torn down uh, essentially in one night in, in 1938. And uh, I learned many things on that trip. I learned that no one had been arrested, that there were hundreds of synagogues vandalized, not one arrest, not one, not one confession. There was actually one confession that they found in somebody's autobiography years later who uh, had admitted to being a child and, and to, uh, to rioting and to taking some silver out of the, out of the synagogue, out of the synagogue's ark. But as we were, uh, I was in Germany going from a northern town of Flensburg to, to Berlin, and I was on, on the train, on the Deutsche Bahn train. And a Jew can't ride a train in Germany without thinking about what passed through these tracks anywhere in Eastern Europe, without thinking about what these, it's the same tracks, they haven't replaced the track, they built new tracks after the war and what, what human cargo uh, was carried on these tracks. And I went to the, uh, I was with uh, one, one of my children, and, <clears throat> and went to the, uh, to the drink car to see if there was anything to, to eat or anything kosher to eat. And there was, you know, small things available. And then I saw over the counter that there was a Reese's Pieces that was sitting over the counter, which is my daughter's favorite candy bar. And, uh, and I started a conversation with the employee who was working there. Can I buy that candy bar? He said, no, that's my personal candy bar. We don't sell that. That's my snack. 
I said, I'll pay you twice the price. We're very hungry. We keep kosher. There's not a lot of kosher food here. If we can have that Reese's Pieces. Anyway, this conversation went on and on. And finally, you know, I saw his name. His name was Vadim. And I said to him, Vadim, and I spoke to him in Russian. And I said, Vadim, where, where are you from? And he told me a little bit of his story. And he saw my kippah. I was wearing a kippah. I wear a kippah on the train in Germany. I can't hide that. And he said, uh, he said, I'm also, I'm also Jewish. I said, wow, look at this, a Jew working for the German National Railroad. And I'm meeting them on the train between now between Hamburg and, and Berlin. This is amazing. So I started talking to him about his Jewish heritage and what he knows and what he's learned and where he grew up. I was very, I believe every interaction is for a reason, and, and this must be, there must be a reason for this. And and then we were talking, and I said, Let him tell me about your parents. And he started telling me about his mother, and then mid-sentence, he turned his back to me and went to the to, to take some hot water out and fill up a cup for tea. Mid-sentence. And I saw what had happened. His colleague was walking in behind me. And Vadim could not bear that his colleague would hear him talking about his Jewish identity. And to me, that was tragic. That for all we talk about integration, all we talk about freedom, the fact that a Jew so short in terms of human history after the Holocaust has to hide their Jewish identity while working for the German National Railroad was a, was a great tragedy. What does anti-Semitism, what does it look like? And the answer is I really don't know because the Jews essentially, again, nobody's fighting for primacy and victimhood or for a monopoly of who the greatest victim is, but the Jew as far as I know is the minority that when we are attacked, as inevitably happens, since Pittsburgh a year ago, there have been 13 separate plots to attack Jewish institutions in the United States alone, including last week in Pueblo, Colorado, which thankfully was caught just in time. The Jew is the minority who, when we are attacked, we ask, where did it come from? Did it come from the right? who say that Jews will not replace us, who say that George Soros controls everything in the world, who says that we're the representation of liberal values that corrupt the world? Is it <clears throat> coming from the left who tell us that Israel, that the most liberal generation of students and young people in the world who have abandoned all other biases and prejudices, who still tell us that Israel is an apartheid state and is a racist state against all available evidence? Is it coming from the left to tell us that Sheldon Addison who tell us that, that the evils of the world are from, are from the Jews? Is it coming from the neo-Nazis? Is it coming, where is it coming from? Because we never know because it's coming from all sides. In the last number of years, I've visited synagogues in Venezuela that have been attacked. I've stood outside the Hyper Kasher supermarket in Paris and cried for the attack by Muslim extremists on, on the Jewish community. I visited the site where Ilan Halimi's body was discovered, Ilan Halimi, and to speak about, again, those who suspect the Jewish community for things that, that uh, frankly, I don't know if these are the historical anti-Semitism. Let me quote for a moment, and get to Ilan Halimi, and I'll, and I'll close with that in a moment. The attack in Halle, Germany. The rabbi of the synagogue, a very dear friend of mine, I went a few days later to visit and learned while I was there a quote I saw in, in Der Spiegel, in one of, the, one of the German newspapers, a quote of the mother of the terrorist who carried out the attack. And the mother of the terrorist said, Er hat nichts gegen Juden in dem Sinne. He has nothing against Jews per se. Er hat was gegen die Leute, die hinter die finanziellen Macht stehen. He has something against the people who stand behind financial power, the financial might of the world. Nothing against Jews, just against those who are controlling the world. And wer hat das nicht? And she said, who doesn't? Who wouldn't hate the people who are controlling the world? Which is what led him to attack a synagogue filled with, with poor Russian immigrant Jews trying to make a life for themselves in Germany, and they're being attacked for controlling for controlling the world. We started with Jewish jokes. There's no greater joke for the Jews than that, than that conspiracy. Ilan Halimi was a young man who was living in Paris, working in Paris, working at a cell phone store. A young woman walked in of Muslim descent. They started 
talking to talk about how integrated in society religion never came up in their flirtations with each other. She made a date with him. He showed up for the date. Her brothers and some others abducted him, tortured him, and he died once he was uh, discovered on his way actually to the hospital. And this past, uh, this past winter, I visited the site where his, his body was discovered and the site that has been desecrated over and over again by people who want to erase the evidence and erase the memory of those who have been, who have been, uh, who have been attacked. Anti-Semitism comes from the right, it comes from the left, the convenient narrative, like Tanya Gersh, who's a, who's a, a friend who I know from Montana, who has been targeted, her son, her son, pre-bar mitzvah, her 11, 12-year-old son at the time, had his face transposed or photoshopped onto a picture of the, uh, of the iconic gates of Auschwitz to show, we'll get your son, we'll get your son too. That's from the neo-Nazis, the attacks on Jews in New York City are not happening from neo-Nazis, they're, they're happening from people who would never vote Republican. They're happening from, from minorities, they're happening from people who are sharing the streets with many visible Jews and visible minorities. We don't know where it comes from, we just know that it's still there. And so I want to kind of close with this point, which is that for us, the recognition of this, of this evil is of utmost importance, while acknowledging that the classical forms of anti-Semitism that we know from our history, thankfully, do not exist. The government is not coming out and burning Jewish books or endorsing the imprisonment or removing the citizenship of the Jewish members of, of society. But that being said, we're always on alert and our eyes are always open because we know from our experience, from our collective experience, that what starts with words never ends with words. We know just how dangerous this hatred, this hatred can be. And I'll mention, spoke about the state of Israel, it was just a few short years ago, that the Jewish population of the state of Israel exceeded the number of those who were murdered in the Holocaust. And it took some 70 years of the Jewish state to, and I won't use the word replace because that's not an appropriate word, but to match the numbers of those who were murdered in the Holocaust, it took the good part of a century to, um, uh, to restore the numbers at the, at, at the very least. And that's something that, uh, that we look to for inspiration and will not be apologetic in our love for the state of Israel, which all, with all of its faults, but are very aware when people fixate on Israel, it's never, about, it's never about Israel, it's never about its policies, it's about something much uglier and much older that we, that we know and see very well. Thank you very much.
Conservative Party of Canada is a bit Nazi-like. And I'm saying that that symbol should never appear anywhere, just as a general rule. So I think we should focus a bit tonight, as I take questions from all of you, on these issues surrounding especially moral dilution and how also questions of anti-Zionist rhetoric on campuses can spread into something a lot more violent. So with that, um, please kindly ensure that you keep your questions brief. Uh, I will possibly, if you would like, I could take a few questions at a time, but perhaps uh, the easiest way to really hear from each of you would be to do one at a time, uh, but just make sure that each of you can participate because we have, I would say, about 30 minutes. So I'll take the first question. It was a fairly pessimistic picture that you both drew. But the title is the prevention. I don't know whether there's any answer to this. Is there any prevention to all the anti semitism This is directed at any specific. Uh, both of them. <laughs> yes, we were saving that answer. It's in our back pocket. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, I, I actually think it's interesting to you know one of the connections between the two talks, I think, is about how we can focus on the state and state rules and, and progress and positive change in state rules and still be worried, justifiably worried, when there are kind of less visible non-state um, uh, interactions and, and uh, modes of racism, anti-Semitism, uh, discrimination. But, but that goes the other way too, right? That um, even when the state rules don't look so good or when responses aren't perhaps as effective as we would like them to be, there are many instances of ways um, many instances of best practices, ways in which actually people on the ground in non-state contexts do make progress, do actually come together and learn. I mean, as a member of an academic community on a campus, I take it as my responsibility as a professor both to be aware of the ways in which, and I'm not going to repeat what Lauren just talked about, talked about in response to Rabbi Shire's talk, way, ways in which there are misunderstandings, accusations, uh, uh, missed opportunities to sit and learn from each other and talk with each other. But it's also my responsibility as a professor to ensure that, that to model that kind of curiosity, constructive critique, possibility of learning, ways in which uh, uh, news, and sources and, and examples um, are, uh, are available uh, for a student. So one of the things I do, for example, in social diversity and law is include Israeli examples and scholarship, sometimes in surprising ways for my students. Uh, so that when we talk about um, uh, uh, family law issues and adoption rules, with respect to race matching or religion matching, we have, which has happened in many countries and uh, many different times. I'll use an, uh, an example of scholarship by the past uh, dean of the law school at Hebrew University. I use work done by a Bedouin feminist social worker here um, at McGill and Al Alsana. So that students, I think, in a sense that that kind of normalizes. Like I just convey that that's, these are these are sources, just like others, where we draw examples, we can be critical, but we're listening, we're learning together. <coughs> um, and so actually, I, I, I actually think that there are lots of possibilities and lots of ways in which we can be, um, uh, which we can be very positive. The fact that there's a municipal borough councillor in Utrecht who's a Hasidic woman, and, and she has lots of challenges, both dealing with the other counselors who aren't Hasidic, but also dealing with people within the Hasidic community. Uh, but that's that's very positive to me. They're all the, the kind of depends on where we look, right? And, and that doesn't mean.
need to, to stick our head in the sand and kind of um, not uh, pay attention to rules and uh, examples and texts and uh, confrontations, but also to look, I think, for the constructive conversations and moments. I'll end, um, you know, for, I, I've been a rabbi in Montreal now for 15 years. For 15 years, I've been addressing Congregation Shar Shemayim in Westmount on the high holidays and, and other times as well, and thinking about the message and, and every year kind of go through the, the topics. What's the what's the message you want to convey? And and should I focus on anti-Semitism? And for 14 years, I said no. I said anti-Semitism is too depressing. I want on, on our holidays we have to give hope. We have to kind of convey a message of, of strength. And of, and of stability, and we're here to stay, and we're not going anywhere, and they're not going to chase us out. And for 14 years I resisted, and then this year was the first year on the, the major holidays that I addressed uh, anti-Semitism, because I felt like we had reached a, a boiling point, that something had, something had changed in the, in, in the discourse. Um, you know, I think we have many, many different tactics now in ways of responding to hate in general that we didn't have in the past, and, and the use of media and social media and access to, to messages is very important, and never to allow, you know, re reaffirming ourselves, our mission, never to allow hatred to be normalized, even when, and you know, say this as a, a lover of Israel and of Zionism, and never to allow a movement like BDS to be normalized as an intellectual, academic, movement, one that focuses and vilifies one country over anyone else for a movement that that will put eviction notices on the doors of Jewish students who don't have Israeli passports and never been to Israel, and even if they were, that would be horrible. Um, I, I think the ability to stand up and speak truth, I don't want to call it power, but speak, speak our truth. Um, it, it is very important. I think also focusing on, on where we have made progress. I had this moment in, in Germany when I visited uh, a few days after the attack. The attack was on Wednesday, which was Yom Kippur. And I went for that Shabbat to um, spend in, in, in Germany. And one thing that I did, I just went to help out. I, I, I confirmed with my friend that my presence would be, would be useful. And uh, the rabbi there, and he said, yeah, please come. And when I showed up on on Friday evening, there were about 200 people standing outside in, in solidarity, which was, which was very beautiful. And then I went inside the synagogue and uh, spoke to my friend, embraced him, hugged him, tried to give him some strength. And he said, would you do me a favor? We have a, a ser prayer service inside the synagogue uh, for the members of our community. But we've promised the general public that we're going to do a service outside. Also, would you conduct the service outside the synagogue so I can be here inside with with the members of my community. I said, well, that's why I'm here. It would be, it would be my, my great honor. He said, we called it for 6.30 p.m. It was about 6 o'clock at that time. So I waited a half hour and then walked outside the synagogue. And I walked outside the doors of the synagogue into a little courtyard. And there's a wall that separates, that separates the courtyard from the street. And then we opened the door to the street. And I walked outside. And there were about 3,000 people standing outside the synagogue for a Friday night service, which I was honored to conduct. But the first thought that went through my, my mind when I saw those, those 3,000 people were, where were you in 1938 when they attacked the synagogues? Where were you when the synagogues were burning and the Jews were being deported and run out? Where were you when they were voting to strip Jews of their citizenship and, and restrict the financial ability, the economic abilities of Jews to act within? And then, you know, as I, as I stood there, I, I had that first very negative historical reaction. And then that changed in a few minutes of standing there and kind of feeling that absolute sense of love to say, you know, we should appreciate how much has, has changed. That, yes, these attacks still happen, but the Pittsburgh Steelers put a Magain David on their cleats for a week or weeks after the attack, that's an extraordinary gesture of, of solidarity, and there is something very beautiful to be embraced about that, that this is no longer society at large which is attacking the Jewish community in most cases, but rather this is, these are extremists that we need to understand how to confront and how to, how to deal with. 
and, and it's very painful to do that, but very, but very empowering to, to realize that, that we do have tools in our hands to embrace solidarity and to speak our truth, which we have not had throughout much of Jewish history. Avoid being um, the, the, the McGill person up here who's an answering for you know what what we can do at, at the university. Um, well, I, I would think Lauren, as a student here and as a doctoral student, especially since she's working on this, might have uh, some ideas. Um, stories in my mind as I have been teaching at the law faculty for 26 years and so many um, positive stories about interaction actually at the faculty of law in particular. And it may be that the students who come to the faculty of law after having done some other education or even as they come to law, they're, they're, they're often coming with some commitment to human rights. They're sitting there they're, oh, I'm not saying they're all perfect and they don't make mistakes and they don't say things that, that might be hurtful, but they, but they do come with a kind of sense of responsibility, I think, as students. Um, and the Canadian, the, the, the Jewish Law Students Association last fall, two weeks after uh, the synagogue um, attack in Pittsburgh, organized an open Shabbat dinner, inviting anybody at the, in, in the law community to come. And they asked me to speak uh, um, as a, about reflections on being a Jewish jurist, in general. And then 
So I thought, sure, I had gone to some Shabbat dinners for the Jewish Law Students Association over the years. They're usually five to ten people at a time. The, the morning of the Shabbat dinner, they said, by the way, we have 70 students at the Shabbat dinner this evening. I said, what do you mean you have 70 students? They said, oh yes, and there's a wait list. I mean, people want to come, they want to come together, they want to, and they're really looking forward to listening. And I think that, I mean, again, look, I, I'm not gonna kind of apologize or, or I'm not even apologize, but I try to go through my daily life at McGill without paying attention to the McGill daily. <laughs> so, uh, but, and it is possible. Um, and I, I, I do worry sometimes about the overuse of the language of not having safe space. I, I actually, as a professor, I, particularly a professor of law, I don't want to guarantee to my students that my classroom is a safe space or that all of their time at the university will feel always safe. Now, I, I, so here's where the fuzzy line is, right, between what is unacceptable and what is just really hard and something that you're going to learn from and you're going to participate in, you're going to contribute and you're not going to give up. Um, and that's part of learning as a, as a university student. I, some of my classes, particularly in, in civil wrongs, are about things, horrible things that happen to people. And students come up and say they're very emotionally affected. And I say, good, that's what you have to be. And if you're going to be a good jurist, you better care. You can't, you can't go through without without feeling empathy for the other, without feeling, uh, without uh, sometimes feeling, uh, you know, worried about yourself and, and having your feelings hurt. I, I'm, I'm not always convinced that um, the trope of safety and security is going to get us to the kinds of conversations that we need to have. simply to you know, reiterate, obviously growth comes through conflict, and also that we, we always struggle as a community as to how much to focus on, on the negative. Do we reinforce a voice that ultimately would nor normally be a marginalized voice by, by highlighting it? I, I don't, my sense is that you know, there are very few people who see the McGill Daily as the authentic voice of the McGill student, student body. It, it, is, it does have the name McGill, it does espouse certain Positions, but but uh, you know by no means would, would anyone assume that that's the authoritative mm -hmm. voice of of McGill. I, I'm, I'm reminded almost as an analogy of when um, in in the first in, when Obama was elected the first time, they tried to play on Islamophobic tropes and argue that Barack Obama was Muslim as a way of discounting him, and his campaign uh, tried to fight that. And went out and said Barack Obama is not is not a Muslim, and they they learned that by repeating the negative, by even saying Barack Obama and Muslim in the same sentence, even though it contained the word "not," that more people actually believed that he was by their refusal, and only by parading out his pastor and showing the church he had gone to for all those years, that they were able to to kind of disprove that that theory. And I think in many ways. You know anything that's out there to try to discount or or try to denigrate? We always struggle with how much do we fight it by fighting it. You know, has, has the McGill Daily's readership benefited tenfold by the fact that it put those offensive pieces out there and we fight it with such with such force? Are we amplifying their opinions? And I think we struggle with this as a community to make sure that 
when something is said that we set the record straight, and when something is said in the name of the university, that we make sure that that's clarified with the university leadership as to whether that reflects the views of the university, and if so, to act appropriately. And on the other hand, sometimes what might represent an extremist view within within a group of people, such as a student body at McGill, might uh, might be best to, to, to lay there in the, in, the, in the shadows rather than to have our light shine on. Question. The answer is yes. <laughs> it does affect. It does affect Jewish identity. Jewish identity. What would Judaism look like without anti-Semitism? Uh, we don't know. We've never. We've never seen it. What? What would a, a synagogue look like without security outside? Without a security guard standing outside? We we don't, we don't remember anymore what what it was like. And that's our that's our struggle. You know, would we prefer to emphasize only the positive? and to kind of relegate the Holocaust to kind of interesting anecdotes of history that could have happened, that happened then, but could never happen anymore, we would love to. We, we struggle with this as organizations constantly. Our synagogue, for example, you know, how do we want to present ourselves? With open doors. Everyone who comes in should be embraced first before we, we check the contents of their, of their bags and make sure that they're not a threat to our physical safety. Um, I don't have anything more profound than simply to acknowledge that absolutely we are affected by being on the defensive, whether it's a real fear or a perceived fear, by positioning ourselves in this place of, if not victim, then potential, then potential victim always around, around the corner. It holds us back from embracing positions of, of pride in many cases and, and kind of authentic uh, integrity of our positions and a fear of rebuttal and a fear of attack. Um, I think for, for sure it holds us back, it minimizes us, which is why discussions like this are so important, to understand what it is that we're protecting ourselves against, changing our own identity, putting on not a mask but a shield, which, uh, which ultimately we hope will protect us, but may in many cases obscure our, our real identity, and we have to make sure that, that our voice, our authentic voice is heard, and not just that voice of, of self-protection. Uh, I'll just add a, a, a response with, with two um, small images. Uh, one is from the year that my family um, spent in Buenos Aires in 2010-11. I didn't realize that the rabbi had five daughters. I have three sons. So, so but, but the eldest at the time was getting ready for his bar mitzvah. Um, and so I, I was taking him every uh, Shabbat to the synagogue nearby. We would walk 15 minutes. The synagogues in Buenos Aires, since the Amia uh, attack, all have kind of extra walls that have been built in front so that nobody, as you walk down the street, I mean, it's a little bit like the school I talked about that is the front of, of a synagogue, but the synagogue is functional. That is, you're not supposed to see it, but it's actually there, but only certain people are supposed to know. And then there's a special little hut in front, security hut with somebody. And on top of that, as you approached the synagogue every Friday evening, within four blocks of the synagogue, in all directions, were young men volunteering, who were members of the synagogue community, volunteering to kind of just stake out the area around and watch who was approaching. Um, luckily, Daniel, we, we sent our, our boys to, uh, to um, Jewish summer camp for a couple of weeks. They don't do summer camp very well in Argentina, but they did for a 
couple of weeks, in January. So actually, uh, all of these young men doing this kind of undercover security work recognized him. They didn't know me, but as he got close, they were like, oh, daddy, and they give him a, a Everybody's very um, affectionate, and you get lots of kisses and hugs on his way. But I thought, wow, I'm, we're really fortunate to be coming back to Montreal where we don't have to hide our places of worship, and I hope uh, we never uh, come to that. My other image is of a, a reading that I give on the first day, I don't know when, I could test Lauren, see if she remembers this. This is fair enough, it was a few years ago. But the first day of social diversity in law, I give a, a little uh, excerpt from a poet in Scotland named Jackie Kay. And one of the lines um, that I love in, in the excerpt is where she says, sometimes I wish that I didn't have to talk about being black and lesbian and Jamaican and Scottish. I wish people would just call me a poet. And, I, and it's, it's a nice way to start the course and to get people to think about the ways in which they, all of us, understand our own identities and the ways we would describe that to ourselves in, in ways that aren't shaped by our interactions. But of course, interactions are also a good thing. Interactions are part of how human beings live and, and we're constantly um, defining ourselves through interactions with others. graduate work on that, then you're going to be the expert. <laughs> um, uh, and, and obviously as a graduate student, you should always choose a project that doesn't have easy answers. Um, and I don't have easy answers for that. What, what you do know if you're doing graduate work in law is that law and legal language and legal categories are not capable of reflecting the real complexity of people's lives and human beings themselves. I mean, even um, uh, human rights charters and codes, you know, kind of, if you just read the words, it, it makes it sound as if we're all very easily characterized by these few words that are right, used to say that you can't discriminate on those bases. Well, first of all, of course, we know that there's lots of intersectionality, so that you know you you can uh, be discriminated against on on many bases all at the same time, and it's hard to distinguish which one is the thing that is the reason for which you didn't get a job or you didn't get an apartment, right? Whatever. So there's that, but, but it's also that all of that, that categorization. Um, is, in a sense, necessarily in legal language somewhat simplistic when compared to the real complexities with which we understand ourselves, with which we experience something like anti-Semitism or racism or homophobia or sexism or whatever it is, there's just going to be a greater um, complexity to that. And finally, I think over the last 30 years with identity politics, I think it's always the more visible and in a sense more, um, well particularly in religion, often the more orthodox versions that, pe that get stuck in people's minds as the representation of what it means to be 
Muslim or Jewish or uh, uh, or uh, frankly uh, black or Aboriginal, right? That that there are kind of particular versions that within those communities people know that there is just a whole spectrum of ways in which people live their religion or culture, uh, their sexuality, whatever it is. But law is kind of necessarily limited in terms of how it can be looked at. Okay, we have time for one more. And uh, we'll proceed to the reception downstairs. Yes. My question is to you. Um, I see you organize this. So there's very few students here.
issue. I just want to close not with an anecdote or not with philosophy, but with one of, of kind of the traditional stories that we tell about a teacher who asked uh, his, his students, a rabbi who asked his students, how can you tell the difference between night and day? How do you know when night has turned into day? What's that? What's that moment? What does that look like? And one of the students said, well, when I look out at the fields and I can see the difference between, I can see where my field ends and my neighbor's field begins, that's when I know that night has turned into day. And the second student says, well, when I'm standing in the fields and I look at the houses and I can tell which one of the houses is my house, that's when I know that, that the light is there and that night has turned into day. And the third student said, when I look at the, in the barn and I can tell the difference between you know, a, a horse and a, and, and a cow, that's when I know that that night has turned into day and, and the, the, the sage, the rabbi, was frowning at all of these answers. And he said, you missed the point because all you see when the light comes out is differences. You see the difference between my field and yours, you see the difference between my house and yours, you see the difference between this animal and that. All you see is distinctions. You say, I'll tell you when night turns to day is when I look at the person sitting next to me and I can see that they're my brother or my sister. I can see that we're alike. That's when I know that night has turned into day. And I think in exploring some of these darker corners of, of thought and, and hatred and the challenges of existence, to kind of look around and find and find bedfellows and find people with whom with whom we're like-minded and are willing to fight together for, for good, that's actually quite an empowering, empowering experience. So I think it's it's one thing. You know, to notice who is not here, it's quite another to notice who is here and to say this is actually a beautiful, beautiful gathering and there should be more like this and we'll, we already worked on our speeches, we'll do this again for a different crowd if you want, we'll come back. We're happy to do it. Right, thank you.